Elections in India are monumental in scale. There are massive political rallies, road shows, massive hoardings like these, and full-page newspaper advertisement are a common sight. And then there's also social media campaign. This time around, elections will go on for 44 days in seven phases from April 19th until June 1st, which means politicians will be crisscrossing the country, engaging with the people and convening meetings. And no stone is left unturned as billions are spent to expand their support base. But where does this money come from? There's a simple answer to this and a complex one. But let's begin with a simple one. There are numerous ways political parties are funded. There's bank interest, party membership fees, contributions from meetings and rallies, sale of coupons and publications, as well as voluntary donations. But the single largest source of income for the political parties comes from electoral bonds. And this is where it gets complex. What are electoral bonds? Electoral bonds are essentially donations to political parties, facilitated by India's top bank, the State Bank of India. Think of them as currency notes. SBI sold these bonds. They were bought by individuals, groups, corporate organizations, which were then donated to the party of their choice. The political party could then redeem them. Until last month, these donations were a secret. No one knew who donated the money, how much was donated and to which political parties. But everything changed in February this year. India's Supreme Court banned electoral bonds. The Supreme Court has struck down electoral bonds. The Supreme Court unanimously called the electoral bond scheme unconstitutional. Well, the electoral bonds verdict is a, is a very good verdict. It is a big step towards transparency of political financing in India. That would be a good thing for democracy, I think. Professor Jagdeep Choka is the co-founder of the Association for Democratic Reforms, a civil society NGO which was the petitioner that challenged this system in the court. More than 50% of the, electoral, the donations through electoral bonds went to the ruling party and to all the remaining parties which are in hundreds. Uh, they all put together got about 47 or some percent. The ruling party had uh, an advantage over other parties, so it was not a level playing field, which is a requirement for free and fair elections and for a democracy. According to the numbers crunched by Professor Choker's team, individuals and companies bought 165 billion rupees worth of bonds up to November 2023. So the question is, who has benefited the most from these donations? Pushed by the Supreme Court, the State Bank of India finally revealed the top donors and the top beneficiaries. These companies, most of them from the infrastructure, metals and energy sectors, were the top donors. A lion's share of these donations flowed into the accounts of Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janta Party, followed by All India Trinamool Congress. Rahul Gandhi's Indian National Congress ranked third on this list. With so much money at disposal, Indian election is one of the world's most expensive elections. In 2019, India's election spending surged past United States, with political parties, candidates and regulatory bodies spending a whopping 8.6 billion US dollars. The only estimate available for the 2019 election is by an institution called Center for Media Studies, who said that about 55,000 to 60,000 rupees, crores of rupees were spent. 45 to 55% of this amount was spent by the ruling BJP. Congress spent about 15 to 20 percent of this amount. 35 percent of this money was spent on campaigns and 25 percent was distributed among voters illegally. Very often it is said that voters are bribed, voters are paid cash. In their daily newspaper some amount of money is put. 
there is also a widespread uh, belief that voters are given alcohol alcoholic drinks the night before uh, there have been open uh, offers by several political parties to give sewing machines to give mixer grinders to give televisions these are all above board things but obviously a whole lot of underground activity happens misuse of money hum nahi hone denge iske liye bhi humne enforcement agencies ko sab states mein enforcement agencies ke sath baithak ki hai all candidates together spent about 240 billion rupees way above the permitted limit that's right there's a limit to how much a candidate can spend in these elections a candidate can spend between 7.5 and 9.5 million rupees depending on the state they are contesting from but there is no limit set for political parties so there is huge amount of money spent in the election which to my mind is indeterminable only political parties all put together know this and they never tell that some analysts project the 2024 elections will surpass all previous records in india to become the costliest the world has ever seen with the bjp touted as the wealthiest party right now financial resources abound however despite the money power navigating elections is still not easy feat for them Hindi Hindu Hindustan Does this formula resonate with South India? I'm here in Chennai capital of Tamil Nadu, one of the biggest cities in South India. It is distinct from the rest of the country. In fact, South India has its own religious, ethnic and linguistic pride. In 2019, the Narendra Modi led Bharatiya Janata Party swept most of the seats. In fact, today the party is governing most of northern and western India. but in the south there is still not much saffron on the map why is that the case and how will south india be voting this general election the bjp are on a mission to make big inroads into the five states and two union territories that officially make up the south indian region where more than 250 million people live politically south india elects 132 members to the lower house the lok sabha which is about a quarter of the total seats in the last election the bjp won just 30 seats in south india but one man is hoping to change that chennai businessman vinod p selvam is proudly flying the bjp's flag here in central chennai for one of the 39 lok sabha seats up for grabs in tamil nadu and i joined him on one of his campaign rallies How confident are you of the BJP in the south this time? The north of India over the last years have gotten first hand experience of what good governance is. The south for some reason became stagnant because of regional political parties which did not cater to the needs of the common man. Today the reception you are seeing amongst the people in Chennai this is all uh, thanks to Narendra Modi and the Modi guarantee which the people are believing in. In Tamil Nadu today there is zero governance. people want governance people want good governance people want progress but this isn't an easy fight for vinoj because in tamil nadu it's the dmk or the dravida munnetra kalagam party that dominates in both state and federal legislatures and is led by mk stalin his party is also a major partner in the opposition india alliance being led by the congress party now our only goal is to defeat bjp there is no bigger threat than the bjp to india elsewhere in the south kerala is a congress stronghold where top congress leader rahul gandhi holds his lok sabha seat i feel genuine affection for the people of kerala and in telangana and andhra pradesh two regional parties the bharat rashtra samiti and the ysr congress have comfortable majorities respectively but there is one exception i am in bengaluru india's silicon valley and the capital city of karnataka 
where BJP in 2019 swept most of the Lok Sabha seats. But they suffered a huge defeat in the recent state elections. So what will the results at the national level show this time? I am a BJP supporter because they have rationally done a lot of things which you can see significant changes of. Here in South, people are like very, very practical in a scenario that okay, if they see the change, then it happens. Okay. So it doesn't work on that okay. Since you are my friend, you are going to give vote to Congress, I will also give. No, it doesn't work that way. Whatever party comes in central, if uh, even in Karnataka, if we have the same party, so we will get more. Probably the funding and all. That I I definitely support BJP. Narendra Modi is desperate for a good performance in the south. He is pushing all limits, be it getting in a fighter jet in Bengaluru or diving in waters of Lakshadweep, and inaugurating infrastructure projects in Tamil Nadu. The 73-year-old has been making frequent visits to the south this year to woo voters. I am happy to launch various projects related to B O Chidambaram Nagar for Tutukudi. The BJP and its National Democratic Alliance has set an ambitious goal of winning 400 out of 543 Lok Sabha seats in this election. But BJP has reached near saturation point in the northern electorates. So mathematically, the only way he can reach that target is to gain seats in the south. So can he get there? It's a question I put to Chennai-based political analyst and author A R Venkata Chalapathy. That is going to be a significant jump in the vote share of uh, BJP in uh, Tamil Nadu and also in Kerala. All other parties in South India are well established, which means that there is very little scope for new entrants. So BJP as a new party with great resources it opens up avenues for new entrants into politics post 2019 the bjp has reworked its strategy for the south now for long regional parties have relied on welfare schemes and policies to appeal to the masses and so in the recent times bjp's campaigns have been focused in smaller towns and villages to popularize schemes brought by the BJP government at the center but why is it that the modi or bjp charm hasn't yet succeeded in the south as it has in the north well the reasons are historical and ideological firstly political experts here say many voters have long rejected the bjp's hindu nationalist agenda or the hindutva the very nature of uh, the hindu religion in south india and north india are very very different Hinduism in South India has had a democratic potential. Moreover, prominent politicians like Tamil Nadu's atheist chief minister M K Stalin have accused the BJP of trying to impose the Hindi language to the south. In the latest episode of the Hindi Imposition Row, speaking and in fact responding to Amit Shah's Hindi Day speech, M K Stalin said, "Don't attempt to turn India into India." It's a perception that the ruling party is trying to shake off in the south. Tamil bhasha vishv ki sabse purani bhashaon mein se ek hai. Shayad Tamil ka vyakaran bhi vishv ke sabse purane vyakaran mein se ek hai. Tamil bhasha ka badhava aur Tamil bhasha ko samruddh karna na keval Tamil Nadu hai, pure desh ki zimmedari hai. BJP especially modi you know very particular that he would speak only in hindi that really puts off people completely no resonance another challenge facing the prime minister is that he isn't hailed as a revolutionary leader because the south has its own revered figures such as jayalalitha and chandra babu naidu who are credited with sparking economic and technological growth in tamil nadu and andhra pradesh Tamil Nadu is rooted in Dravidianism for nearly a century. What does this mean? This is an inclusive philosophy that consolidates people from all religions and castes for the cause of social justice. The Dravidian model does not believe in trickle-down economics; instead, focuses on welfare schemes, on food security, health, education. 
I spent a day with a proud Tamil family that strongly believes that a Dravidian model can strengthen democracy in India. I need a leader who understands where I'm from, what I have been taught and what my history is. That's where the Tamil pride comes. If we speak about BJP ideology, it's more or less revolving around a particular religion, which is fair. If that's your base, it is fair. But is that religion or your ideology trying to suppress other religion or the food I eat, the dress I wear, where I work, then that ideology can't be the base core. They are trying to impose their ideology on us, which is like, it's too much pressure for us. The Hindutva ideology may not have resonated with many in the South, but it has had an impact on religious minorities. In Karnataka, there are more than 8 million Muslims. This community has faced bans on cow slaughter and business boycotts, while Muslim girls were barred from wearing the hijab on school campuses. Sumaya is a social worker here in Bengaluru and says her community feels like it's under threat. The biggest failure of this government will be cultivating hatred. Today, we can say that it's Muslims that, you know, they are, that who are being threatened. Only in places where BJP is not powerful, Muslim votes are of any consequence. Kerala, Tamil Nadu to a certain extent. Hyderabad. Hyderabad. But back in Chennai, election candidate Vinod Selvam says it's the BJP that's been representing all Indians. We are the most secular party the country has seen. The last 10 years of uh, Narendra Modi government has ensured that there has been no uh, communal riots all across the country. Despite the differences and challenges faced by the BJP in the South, there is no doubting Narendra Modi's ambitions here. At the very least, it is to test if the party has surpassed their own performance from 2019. I'm here at the Elliott's Beach, a key landmark in the city of Chennai, here to find out what people are thinking. So, tell me, what is your opinion of the BJP in the South? So, BJP to me is a bunch of outsiders, particularly to the South and to the state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, they are trying to make their presence felt uh, by whatever ways they can, but uh, I'm not sure uh, they will bear fruit in this upcoming Lok Sabha elections. BJP in the South is impossible actually. Uh, being a South Indian, uh, Tamil Nadu, over five decades, we have only Dravidian politics. Like DMK, ADMK, uh, major parties, and like uh, there are minor parties also, PMK, DMDK and whatnot. The BJP's go government has given much cleaner governance, I believe. And uh, apart from that, they've also, uh, a lot of our uh, friends over here, they beg to differ, I believe, that they've not done anything good. But I think the Jan Dhan Yojana that the BJP is bought in, the direct benefit transfer to all the people, I think that is a master stroke and that, that is the need of the hour, basically. Otherwise, what used to happen out of 100 rupees, people used to get 50 or 60 rupees. The rest used to go into the politicians' pockets. Now they get the full money. So we just want, you know, the same Prime Minister to come in to our rescue when we are down in neck deep of water, when the floods happen. And not just come for inaugurations and functions and uh, to celebrate with us. You know, that's also an important event where we really, really require the country's head to help us with support and financial aid. As the voters here cast their ballots, the results will reveal the success and the failures of the BJP and the India Alliance in the battle for the South. But elsewhere, it's a different problem that even politicians are struggling with. Far from the metropolitan cities and isolated from New Delhi is Manipur. The northeastern state is home to around 3.3 million people. Half of them are Maitai people who follow Hinduism and Sanamaism, while around 43% are Kukis and Nagas who are Christians. Last year, Manipur met global headlines when ethnic violence erupted in the region. The state of Manipur in the northeast of India has been rocked by ethnic violence since May in a conflict marked by brutal murders and sexual crimes against women. We are not safe here. They take 
anywhere, anytime. So we have to move to better place so that we can live. We want President rule. We want the immediate solution is the president's rule. Without that, we have no option. Our children, our mothers, we are all displaced. So many of our villages and our places burn. We trust the central government. We are against the state government. Tens of thousands have fled their homes and both sides have reported cases of sexual assaults. Many women are seeking refuge in camps with their children. It's a conflict that has not spared the most vulnerable. Women have been targeted brutally with several reported incidents. The fighting between these communities so hundreds killed, thousands of homes destroyed and families displaced. Today, thousands of displaced families live in relief camps like this. This one is home to 750 people, men, women and kids were forced to move here after their homes were burned down last year. Children uprooted from their homes and playgrounds now spend their days riding bikes around the muddy fields here. Families have been allocated rooms with mattresses on the floor and a small bench to store their most essential items. And the kitchen is just a massive bench outside the rooms where women often take turns to cook. 27 years old baby Moirangtem belongs to the Maitai community. She was a school teacher in Chorchanpur, a cookie populated area before the riots displaced her family. She now lives at this relief camp with her parents and younger brothers. A month ago, she finally found a job in Manipur's main city in Fall as a teaching staff member. It's not really a cup of tea living in a relief camp. And, but the thing is, we happen to adjust it. And we don't have any means rather than adjusting the situation. Such relief camps are spread across Imphal and its outskirts. A short distance away is the Akampat relief camp. The situation here is just as dire. Displaced women huddled together, working from their ramsackled kitchens and tents. Men forced out from their farming villages and kids playing around the waterlogged compound. <laughs> Maitai woman Fayambam Ganthoibi was rescued by the army when her village was attacked. She has been living with her family at this relief camp since last May. I came with, here with one daughter when she was only four months old and she was feeding by bottle. She was bottle feeding baby, so um, it was very hard for me to buy um, milk, lactose. And yes, uh, now here uh, they supply some, but it cannot be um, sufficient for her. For decades, there has been a deep seated mistrust among the Maitai, Kuki, and Naga communities in Manipur predominantly revolving around disputes over land and influence. The latest spread of violence was triggered by a High Court judgment in May last year when it ordered the state government to give the Maitai community an official tribal status. Cookies protested against this judgment leading to the fighting. The violence had ramifications for New Delhi as Prime Minister Narendra Modi faced a no-confidence motion brought by the opposition. Speaker Sir, in the name of Manipur, the Hindustan has been killed. Only the Hindustan has been killed. The government dismissed the motion as a headline-grabbing gimmick and after a walkout by the opposition, the no-confidence motion was easily defeated. Manipur is also awash with weapons. Several rebel groups on all sides are heavily armed. Most of these weapons have been stolen from the local police stations. The fight is over resources and ethnicity rather than religion. The conflict between the two groups has been going on for decades. And it is a complex, multi-layered issue. An issue that the BJP ruled state government has been accused of mishandling. Last year, BJP state legislature wrote to the Prime Minister office stating there was a complete breakdown of law and order in Manipur. I met with Yambem Lava, the ex-chairman of Manipur Human Rights Commission, who has been outspoken about the ongoing crisis. Now, since the 3rd of May, some 200 plus people have been killed. 
Some 60,000 people have been rendered homeless. 8, 9,000 houses have been burnt. And the government has not been able to do anything except providing them with a token relief of some makeshift houses for the sake of publicity. Voters here will be casting their ballots on April 19 and 26. The state has two seats in Indian Parliament currently held by the BJP and the ally, the Naga People's Front. Despite the criticism, the BJP is confident of returning power here. The election commission has arranged voting facilities for the displaced communities at the relief camp. But when asked about how they will vote, many say it's the last thing on their mind. Because I lost all my faith in vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have lost all my faith. Our minds are engaged with, do, with all this uh, conflict stuff and what to do for the future and all these things, our minds are not free at all times. Truly speaking, we don't trust anyone. Leaders also, now, because they don't do nothing for us at all. Just a few days now until Manipur and several other states go to the polls in the world's largest democracy. And that's a wrap for this episode of India Votes 2024. Thank you for joining us and thank you for writing in as always. Next week, we're going to take a look at how political parties are wooing voters using welfare schemes. And then we travel to Wayanad to follow Narendra Modi's main rival Rahul Gandhi as he visits his constituency. I hope to see you then.